So like I said in class, I really have two goals this week. One is that you learn more of the Python language, but two is that you learn more about programming languages in general. So I have this picture that I showed you from O'Reilly that has a, a timeline of all of the different programming languages or some of the more popular ones. There are a lot of them out there, and hopefully you'll learn several of them uh, throughout your years as a computer science major. Uh, but regardless, all of these languages boil down to the same sorts of features. They can do loops, they can do decisions, they can do procedures and variables and so forth. And so I'd like to show you these concepts today uh, in the context of Python, but again, we're just looking for the general concepts as opposed to learning a lot about programming. Um, I need you to do something uh, to prepare for Wednesday's class. So here I have a list of terms from chapter six that you should be familiar with. Uh, things like assembler, compiler, interpreter, um, the difference between natural language, formal language, the difference between a declarative and an imperative statement, variables, constants, literals, procedure, function, method, parameter, and argument. That's a lot of jargon and a lot of technical terminology, but what it does for us is allows us to talk about specific features of a language in, in a way that we don't have to keep explaining which thing we're talking about. So uh, make sure as you're reading through sections 6.2 and 6.3 of the book, and then also 6.1 uh, from earlier this week, that, that you pay attention to these terms as they're bolded, and maybe what you want to do is just write down a list of definitions next to this on your own sheet. So go ahead and, and do that, and, and bring that with you to class on Wednesday. I'll ask you a few questions about these to make sure we're all on the same page. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start idle. Uh, remember that when you're in the lab, you want to make sure you're running idle for version 2 of Python, or 2.7. So I've got um, one of those already open here. And also, typically what I like to do is uh, say file, new file, or, or open an existing file so that on the left I have my Python shell, or in the interpreter, and on the right I have my editor so I can just write code. I'm just going to go through section 6.2 of the textbook and, and demonstrate in Python some of the concepts. So for example, uh, the very first section is variables and data types. That's on page 269. And I'll make this file available. You should definitely download a copy from the video page and follow along in your own Python shell. Maybe try out some of these same um, commands hands-on rather than just watch the video passively. So let me create some variables. Limit equals 5, pi is 3.14159, name Mayfield happy. Why not? We'll just make happy true. And let me go ahead and save this file. Um, now typically in the Linux lab, when you go to save a file, it shows you all your hidden folders too. So you have to scroll over to uh, your desktop or wherever you want to save these. Oh, look, I already have a couple of those there. I'll just call this one happy. Save. All right, so I've got my happy Python file here. I've got four variables. And if I run this program, you'll see that nothing happens on the right because all I've done was just define some variables. But, you know, I can do a whole bunch of things uh, with these variables. If I just type the name of a variable, it will automatically print out its current value. So I could uh, demonstrate some of the operations you can do. If I add 5 to limit, I get 10. Maybe I'll do pi times 2, and that's twice as much as 3.14159. Um, you can also add text. So I might say doctor space name, and that's Dr. Mayfield. Notice, too, how it changed my uh, double quotes to single quotes. Um, again, the, the quote marks are interchangeable in Python as long as you use the same ones on either end of the text. And finally, I can say uh, not happy, which is false because happy is true. Now the thing I wanted to really demonstrate here with um, variables is that each of them have three things. Um, they have a name, like limit, pi, happy, um, and so forth. And they have a value, which is like 5 or 3 or Mayfield or true. And then they also have a type. So I could say, what is the type of my limit variable? And it tells me the type is an int or integer. Um, what's the type of my pi variable? Well, that's a float or floating point number. Type of name is a string. Type of happy is a bool or boolean. And the type of data is actually really important so that uh, the computer knows how to display or operate on that data. So remember going back to chapter one of the book, the binary representation for numbers is different from that of text and images and sound and so forth. So just because I give a memory address a name, I also have to know how to interpret that memory address. And that's what data types are for. Um, data types also prevent me from doing things that don't make sense. So for example, if I wanted to say 
limit plus name, it will say, wait a minute, you can't add a number to text unless you first convert the number to text or the text to number. Like you can only um, add things that make sense. Let's move on now to the next section in 6.2. Um, this one is about data structures. And we're not going to spend a lot of time this week on data structures because there's a whole chapter about that um, coming up in a couple weeks. But one thing you should know in Python is it's really easy to make a list of things. So let's say, for example, I want to make a variable called scores, and these might be the scores I got on my exams, let's say, right? So I've got 100% on one of them, 92, 89. I'm just making up these numbers. But the nice thing is here is uh, this bracket syntax in Python is a way that you can store multiple values into a single variable, right? So rather than having score one, score two, score three, and so forth, I just have a variable called scores. Let me go ahead and run this code. Um, so I have it down here. And this variable now I can, uh, well, let me just print it out, scores. And notice how it uses the same bracket notation to print them all out. If I just wanted a single score, I can use brackets to ask which one I want. So if I want the first one, I say score sub one. And notice how it actually printed not the first number, but the second element in the list. Uh, these numbers are actually indexed at zero. So if I say score sub zero, I get 87. This is the zeroth element, the first element, the second, the third, and the fourth, depending on how you count, right? So actually index zero is the first and the last one is the fifth element. But if I were to say score sub five in my editor here, it's gonna say, wait a minute, five's out of range, that's past the end of your list, right? If the last one is actually score sub four. We're gonna talk in a couple weeks about why indexes are based at zero in most programming languages. Uh, but the point here is, again, a data structure is a way that you can take lots of data, put it into one variable, and that might be organized as a big long list of things, it might be a dictionary of things or a set of things, and we'll talk about these different data structures uh, later in the course. So let's take a step back and, and talk about constants and literals now, that's actually the next section, but by taking a step back, I'm just gonna pull out these uh, variables I had previously in the video. Um, variables are the names of memory addresses, but literals, on the other hand, are literal values. So five is an integer literal, Mayfield is a string literal, and so forth. True and false are literal Boolean values. And literals are used if you need to hard code a value in your code. So let, let me go ahead and run this again. You know, I might say something like um, print pi, right? That's 3.14159. But notice the difference if I put pi in quotes, right? pi in quotes is a string literal, that's different from pi without quotes, which is a variable. In fact, this is not even a string variable, it's a floating point variable. And notice how Python will put a string literal in green font, whereas just normal words are interpreted as variable names. So a common mistake to make as a programmer is, did you mean to say something literally, or did you mean to recall uh, call a variable name? Um, there's some interesting things that you can do as well. So I already showed you how you can add, uh, where was it, earlier on, you can, you can add two strings together, which just concatenates them into one big string. Uh, you can also multiply strings. I always thought this was an interesting uh, feature of Python. So if I say pi times three, I get pi, 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 right? It's three copies, basically, of, of the same string. Um, so that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, notice how, though, if I say a pi times three, I actually get the number pi multiplied by three. Uh, this is called overloading in terms of a language, and you'll see the term overloading later in the chapter. Basically what it means is you can use the same symbol or the same procedure in a language to mean different things in different contexts. Right here, multiply means make copies of a string. Here, multiply means what multiply means in math, right? Take the number and add it to itself that number of times. Um, now, not every operation is overloaded. So for example, I know that pi plus two is two plus 3.14159. But if I try to do the same thing to a string, oh, sorry, that's not valid, right? So just because you can overload something doesn't mean that it's always overloaded for every symbol in the language. Um, and, and the language reference, you know, if I take you to uh, Python's website and you were to go to the documentation, let me just pull up the Python 2 docs. You know, there's this language reference you can look at, which is this huge library of like what every possible thing is allowed and, and all that. It, it's not something that you would read. It's like reading a dictionary or an encyclopedia. 
But it's nice to refer to to know, you know what the limits are of a programming language. Now one thing I failed to mention is that um, constants are used in some language to make a variable unchangeable. Like you can create a variable that will never be changed, so you can't accidentally change it. Python actually doesn't support constants. Uh, you can't, like all variables, you can always change at any moment. And, um, but other languages like Java allow you to mark a variable as final. I'm never going to change this again. So don't worry too much about that detail as described in the book. Um, I'm more interested this week that you understand the difference between variables and literals. There's another uh, concept that you should understand, and this basically comes from algebra, um, and that's called operator precedence. Uh, you can read about operator precedence on page 275, uh, but it's just like it works in algebra. So let me just give you an example here. If I were to do the amount 1 plus 5 times 2 minus 3, the question is what order do I do this operation? Um, notice how, just like in math, you usually multiply before you can add or subtract. Um, you may have seen the term PEMDAS, uh, which is basically parentheses, then exponentiation, then multiply, divide, add, subtract. That's an acronym that some algebra course, some algebra teachers uh, teach you for learning the order of operations. But note that this is 5 times 2 is 10, plus 1 is 11, minus 3 is 8, right? And if I wanted to force a certain order of operations, I can do the same thing and put parentheses around one of them, right? So this would be 5 plus 1 is 6, times 2 is 12, minus 3 is 9. So notice just by placing those parentheses, I get a different answer. Um, just to drive the point home, I'll do it this way, right? 1 plus 5 times negative 1 is negative 4. So again, um, just, just like the, the rules of algebra, in most programming languages, there's a precedence to operators. And the computer's going to evaluate everything from left to right, but give higher priority to divide and, and multiply um, than it would for adding and subtracting. So the next topic in section 6.2 is control statements. And uh, just for a bit of trivia, the reason why it's called control for things like if and while is these statements control the program counter. So remember thinking back to how machines execute code, you set the program counter of the next instruction to execute. And that's exactly what an if statement does. So here's an example from Python. Let's say I have my happy equals true variable. And if I'm happy, I'm going to print you know it. Otherwise, I'll print why not. And this type of structure in a programming language is basically controlling the flow of execution. Uh, let me go ahead and run this program. Uh, it should be obvious why it prints the word you know it. And you've, of course, I can change that condition and say if I'm not happy, print you know it. So now I print exactly the opposite out. Um, and we talked today in the, or in, in the previous quiz about how an if statement and a while statement are different. Uh, they're basically the same thing. It's just that a while statement will continue to evaluate that condition forever and, until this condition changes. So if I make a loop that says while happy, print great, I'm basically going to get it to print great, 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 great forever. And there's really no way to stop it um, unless you hit control C, um, which is the, the symbol on a computer to say stop, right, or interrupt. So if I hit the control C character, it basically raises this error called key, keyboard interrupt. And that's how I sort of gain control back over my Python shell. I wanted you to see how to break an infinite loop since uh, some of you have experienced that already. And it's just a good skill to know um, on any terminal program. So in this last example, I'm going to skip forward to section 6.3 and talk about procedural units. Um, in Python, these are all called functions. But generically speaking, you have uh, procedures that do something, and you have functions that return values. Um, the book refers to this type of procedure as a fruitful function. Uh, and you can tell the fruit because it has a return statement, right? So let me go ahead and run this code and show you a little bit about how it works. Right, so all I've done is run this file. You can download a copy of this from uh, the video page on the website. And uh, basically, I have two procedures here. So one is greet. I can just go ahead and type greet. Let me go ahead and put in my name here. So I'll just say Mayfield. Right, and we'll say, hello, Mayfield. How are you today? And it, it goes ahead and does that three times. And maybe I'll do another example, like greet, um, you know, Alice. And notice how it's the same procedure, except it took the word that I gave it and filled in the blank there, right? And that's exactly um, what procedures do. They take some kind of parameter or option, and it will go ahead and use that in the procedure. 
Now I've got multiple things going on here. Let me step you through the code. Uh, so this first line here, of course, is just a comment. When you define a procedure or a function, you give it a header. Now, and, and this is going back to what the textbook's going to be talking about in section uh, 6.3. The header will have the name of the procedure and the parameters. Parameters are variables um, that basically get assigned whatever values you specify when you call the procedure. So here I have the name Mayfield. This value gets assigned to that variable name. So notice here I'm going to print out the name. Notice I have a couple other variables here, greeting and question. These actually got assigned way up here. So I'm using a mixture of global variables, which were assigned at the, at the level of the whole file, and local variables, which were assigned local to this uh, procedure here. So for example, I can cheat a little bit. I could say name equals ha 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 ha. And notice if I try to do that greeting again, it says, hello, Alice, hello, Alice, right? Because even though this variable here, name, is the same name as my global variable, name, um, within the scope of this function, name had a different meaning. So you'll read a little bit about in the book about scope. And what scope means is if you have two variables with the same name, whichever one was defined latest is the one that you're referring to, right? So here, if I do this print statement, print greeting, print name, print question, it will look for the closest version of that variable, right? So name is defined here in this function. I can go ahead and just use it. Greeting isn't anywhere to be found, so I'm going to go up a level. Ah, there it is. It's at the top of the module, right? And, and that's basically what it means to be a global variable versus a local variable, is where did you define uh, that variable? Now let me go ahead and focus on this second example here, the one that computes the area of a circle. So remember, the area of a circle is pi r squared, right? So radius squared is just radius times radius. Radius is the value I'm going to give as a parameter for this function area. And let me just go ahead and, and make up a couple examples here. So maybe I want my program to print, you know, a medium pizza is area, let's see, a medium pizza is 12 inches, right? Square, let's see, S Q U A R E inches. And I'll go ahead and do the exact same thing, but change the size to 14 and say, a large pizza. And notice um, what's going on here. I, I'm printing out a message. In the middle of the message, I'm computing a value, right? So area is my function, and the parameter is going to be 12. And let's see what this program does here if I run it. So I'll run, go ahead and hit save. You know, a medium pizza is 452 square inches, and a large pizza is 615 square inches. So the point here isn't about pizzas, of course, right? It's, it's how am I calling this function giving it a value, and it's returning a value back to where this goes, right? So basically, the, 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 um, the programming language itself is going to replace this code, which is in black, with the actual value that's returned from that function, and it all gets printed out as one big message. Um, just a couple minor things about terminology here. So when you refer to a variable um, in the header of a function, it's called the parameter. When you refer to the value that you're assigning that parameter, this is called the argument. And we've seen the word argument before in the course. We had command line arguments, uh, things that you type. So for example, if I just pull open a terminal here and type ls-l, um, -l is an argument to the ls command in the terminal, right? And so there's all my files. Um, but it's, it's the same thing in the programming language. The argument is the value that you're assigning to that parameter. So I just wanted to, to make sure that you were a little bit familiar with those um, terms. Procedures and functions you've seen in this video. You know, functions return a value, procedures don't. Uh, method is another term that you might hear applied to this concept, but that's in object-oriented languages. So we'll talk more about object orientation for the lab this week. Um, but method basically means the same thing. It's the procedure or function for an object. Um, variables, constants, literals we've seen. Uh, declarative versus imperative uh, we've talked about earlier this week in class. So I think we've seen most of the terminology either in class or in this video. And uh, again, just as a reminder, please bring in a sheet of paper with you to class that has the, your own words defining each of these terms. And that way we can make sure that everyone's on the same page and we're ready to start talking about the real meat of things in class. 
So I hope you've enjoyed this little demonstration. Make sure you take a look at those source files on the website, and we'll see you next time.